My name is Josh Prager. I'm a threat hunter for SpectreOps and their defensive clients. Primarily, I work on program development, building security operating centers to a more mature level. Some of the hobbies that I enjoy are astrophotography and spending time with my family. All right, so let's just jump right into it. So starting off, we come to some well-known but often unsaid problems when determining which alerts to look at first. The first issue we come to is a lack of structure, which is a subjective issue. The analyst is allowed to choose any alert for any rhyme or reason. The analyst will want to choose the newest, the easiest, or the novel alert that will inherently create opportunities for the analyst to miss true positives. The second issue we come to is the structure of prioritization is based off assumption. What this means is the scoring structure actually exists. The team put in the time to create the prioritization structure, but it is inherently flawed because it is stagnant and has never been tested. The analysts are prioritizing alerts based on factors that they think are malicious, but have not yet tested that hypothesis. The third issue we run into is a singular factor is used to determine priority. The priority of the alert itself is decided based off of only one factor. This can likely be utilized with precise alerts, such as malware-based antivirus alerts. But for more complex technique-based alerts, this could cause multiple alerts to be ranked as high. And then finally, our last pain point identifies that the scoring structure for the prioritization has never been updated. The scoring structure exists, but it is not updated and scaled for different research, new forms of technique execution, environment changes, or personnel and process changes. First, we need to define some terms specific to this talk. Triage in this case is the concept of adding context to the base condition and establishing a priority according to that funnel of fidelity. When I'm talking about the funnel of fidelity, I'm referring to the project created by Jared Atkinson that walks security operating center analysts through the process of which we collect and respond to alerts. And then let's get into subjective versus objective metrics. Subjective metrics are opinion-based metrics. An example of an opinion-based metric is providing a one to five scale on how good something is. Whereas an objective metric is fact-based and should be the same regardless of the person. An example of a fact-based metric is number of tickets closed by the security operating center. That's not something we can refute and it's something we can identify and validate. So some other terms that you may not have heard of before is a priori and a posteriori. Both of these words are the root of the word priority. And it's a priori, it means derived from logic or reason or to be known true. An example that I give here of this uh, form of hypothesis is a rooster crows when the sun rises. An a posteriori is a proven fact. It's an observed fact, okay? Um, and an example I give with the a posteriori is the sun rises after the rooster crows. Both methods are utilized in prioritization. However, both methods can create misconceptions. A a priori or a hypothesis based misconception would be roosters crow when the sun rises because we don't have evidence on every single rooster crowing. Our misconception could be if there isn't a sun, the rooster won't crow. For our a posteriori, which is completely based on facts, right? No logic or reason has been added to it. Misconceptions can be created there as well. So for the example, the sun rises after the rooster crows, a, a uh, unvalidated form of a, a posteriori, we could make that misconception that the sun rises because the rooster crows. We would have to add in logic or reason to know that the world revolves around the sun and of course not around. All right, so let's start off with our base condition. To effectively prioritize malicious events, we must first derive that base condition. To begin developing our malicious factors and form that scoring, we will need to begin collecting telemetry for our original data set or that base condition. This data set is often derived from either our production environment or our testing environment. We will use the example of service creation for the duration of this presentation. For this example, the base condition for service creation will be collecting telemetry on all created services, both malicious and legitimate within that first data set. When collecting our base condition, we will need to consider the collection method as well. Here I'm giving an example of identifying service creations via the 4697 event ID or identifying service creation via the raw registry key creation event. In this case, we're gonna side with the raw registry key creation event. And we're gonna do this because regardless of what tool interacts with the service control manager, the registry key will still need to be created in HPLM system current control set service. So here's an example of Johnny Johnson's latest automated detection pipeline, Jupyter Notebook project. This project is located in his GitHub. And here in this project, Johnny identifies our base condition as the registry key creation under HKLM system current control set services. The registry key is a necessary choke point for this technique as the operating system will need to identify this key 
in order to start the service at boot time. So the base condition is the registry key creation, which gets us that process that created the service, the process GUID of that process, and the timestamp. But what does it not give us, right? It doesn't give us enough information to make a triage decision on whether or not this is benign or malicious. Why? Because in this situation, in a normal situation, that a service is created, the service control manager would be the one that would create the service, right? We would see a creating process of services.exe and not a PowerShell or reg.exe. What this means is that a process instructs the service control manager or a process instructs the services.exe process to create this registry key. And we need to determine what that process was. So what does it not give us? The name of the process that instructed the service control manager that created that registry key. And it also doesn't give us the user that created that registry key and if that service was created remotely or locally. So in all in all, it's giving us a lot of, a lot of information, but we're really missing that contextual information to make that malicious or benign decision. So how do we do that? Well, we would have to add factors, right? We must add contextual evidence to the base condition to provide the analyst a composite event enabling the benign or malicious decision-making capability. We need to add factors to make that decision, but we don't know what context to add, right? It's a chicken before the egg scenario. So how do we go about identifying which factors to include and how do we validate that these factors are actually aiding us in decision-making? So that takes us to our hypothesis or our a priori, right? To identify factors, we must develop logical hypothesis based off research of the underlying technology. So when talking about the example of service creation, I make four assumptions. here. Assumption number one is a remote service creation is a malicious indicator. Assumption number two is a, bri a binary creating the registry key should be services.exe in a normal situation. Assumption number three is auto start type services are also a malicious indicator. And then assumption number four is processes requesting to create services should be sc.exe in a normal uh, process workflow, right? Each assumption represents our hypothesis of the likelihood to indicate malicious behavior. Each of the hypothesis has been built upon research. But then you could ask, why did we make these assumptions? Because some of these assumptions when looking at it, and if you've looked for service creation in your own environments, you may quickly identify that these assumptions are kind of a, a dangerous assumption to make. Um, the one that sticks out, obviously to me, is auto start type services are malicious factors. Generally, there are many, many auto start type services within the environment natively by default, right? And so adding this to our, our, our base context as a malicious factor may not necessarily work out for us in a realistic environment, okay? And that's okay, these are just assumptions, these are just hypotheses. We will have to validate those assumptions, but first we need to identify how these assumptions came to be. How did we build these assumptions? All right, so hypothesis, hypothesis number one or assumption number one is remote service creation is a malicious indicator, right? The hypothesis is derived from the knowledge of post-exploitation phase the kill chain, okay? I needed an objective metric in order to create my assumption number one. So objectively, I used MITRE ATT&CK, and I looked and I saw that remote service creation accomplishes three tactics or three goals, lateral movement, persistence, and execution, whereas local service creation accomplishes two goals, persistence and execution, okay? Because we know that remote service creation accomplishes so many tactics, we can assume or hypothesize that an adversary may choose remote service creation instead of local service creation to accomplish more than one goal. Now, again, remember this is just a hypothesis and you may look at this and think, well, I can also use local service creation to do privilege escalation as well, which would equal them out. And yes, that's true, but I needed an objective, an objective metric to create this assumption. And MITRE ATT&CK lists three tactics for remote service creation and two for local service creation. Um, and so because of that, I'm going to base this possibly incorrect assumption off of that metric. And then we come into assumption number two, the binary creating the registry key should be services.exe in a normal environment. Hypothesis is derived from the research into the underlying technology. So this is based on the underlying technology that I researched. Um, we can create a hypothesis that anytime HKLM system current control set services, sub registry key is created for a service, and that that process that did it is not services.exe, this could be a malicious indicator. Again, remember at this point, we're still making assumptions, so I would need to go in and I would need to prove that services.exe is the only process, for the most part, that's creating these registry keys. If there is any sort of outlier or difference to that, I need to be able to document that and identify that, and then again, come up with probability. 
So to create a service, there is specific criteria that isn't normally met, and this is what this assumption is based off of. A registry key must be created within HKLM system, current control set and services. Five registry values are set within HKLM system, current control set services. And these changes to the registry are normally made by services.exe at the request of another process. And then we come into assumption number three, auto start type services are a malicious factor. So the hypothesis is derived from the assumption that the adversary will want to successfully survive a reboot autonomously. This hypothesis makes the logical assumption that an adversary would rather have their payload execute upon startup instead of waiting for some external force to interact with their server. Now, if some of you are um, well, well versed red teamers, uh, you can definitely identify a few situations where you may want a manual start type service, um, where you may want some sort of external factor to be what executes your service. Um, but we're going to make this assumption as a, 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 a logical representation of that a priori which is just assuming the adversary will want to survive. All right, and then assumption number four, right? The process requesting to create services should be sc.exe in a normal situation. So this hypothesis looks at the deviation from the baseline behavior within an environment. I wanted to use this assumption specifically because sc.exe is a Windows native binary and a lot of the clients that I work for will oftentimes inherently try to uh, allow list or filter out those Windows native binaries, making the assumption that adversaries will use some new or novel software to complete their objective. And for those of you that are very familiar with SpectreOps uh, techniques and research, um, SpectreOps's red team is very heavy into using living off the land techniques. So this uh, assumption that we should filter out Windows native binaries would be very, very, very dangerous. All right, so now that we've established our hypothesis um, and the factors that we might want to include, right, now we have to identify the likelihood of these being malicious or, or, or just in general, good indicators to add context to our alert, sorry. So from here on out, we're gonna have to test these hypotheses with validation and testing. And it's going to take these, uh, this, these data analytic approaches to turn these hypotheses into empirical evidence, okay, or the a posteriori. If you're not familiar with the term empirical, it means by observation or through validation and testing, right? An example of uh, empirical evidence could be, you can say the ocean is made of water because you've uh, observed yourself both water and the ocean, right? So how do we go about testing our hypothesis? To validate our hypothesis, we need to collect our data set and apply data analytic techniques or statistic-based techniques to identify the differences in criteria that consistently differentiate legitimate from malicious. Many times what this, in, what this entails is statistic analysis to determine uh, deviations from baseline behavior. Some considerations that we need to think about when we're, when we're trying to collect that data set and determine the differences in that data set is our test pool size, our, our data pool size. Um, do we have a singular or multiple uh, environment in there? Do we have singular or multiple data sets in there, and then the variations of those data sets, the, the variations of the environment. There's been many times where I've had a hypothesis or I've had an assumption, and I've gone and tested it on one client environment, and then when I've looked at a second client environment, the results are completely different. The latest example I can think of is I wanted to test uh, any process communicating over port 88 that wasn't LSAT. And I, and I made that assumption that it, this could possibly pick up some sort of like a raw TGS for, uh, crafting tool or some kind of TGT manipulation tool out there. When I tested it in one environment, I found zero results other than like, I think a, a small percentage were Java, but, out, but ruling those out, uh, I found zero results for any malicious indicators of a process communicating uh, over port 88 that wasn't LSAS. But then when I looked in two other clients, I actually found a lot of different unique binaries that were unique to those client environments that were effectively confirming my hypothesis, but also skewing my results. So this does happen quite often and we need to account for that kind of stuff. All right, so how do we go about testing these hypotheses and doing these uh, statistic-based analytics, right? So to identify the differences in our hypothesis, we're gonna utilize descriptive statistics first. Uh, the descriptive statistics is what we can utilize to measure frequency. The measure of frequency, this is the most common utilized technique that I see when it comes to developing a scoring criteria. Uh, a measure of frequency is essentially identifying prevalence in the environment and then trying to identify deviation. 
Um, and then that we also have uh, measures of tendency or uh, measures of prevalence of execution, right? So here we gather the mean, medium, or mode, and we try to determine the commonly indicated response, right? Or the, the, the common indicated event of execution. Uh, and we also have measures of variation for our descriptive statistics. Um, this measure of variation is used to measure the range of data. So this is our high to low, right? What is, what are, what are looking at all the possible outcomes in our data set? What is the highest outcome compared to what is the lowest outcome? And then we have measures of position. This is used to determine the scores formed between multiple data sets within a data pool. Generally, this is kind of the, uh, the final step if you are using every one of these descriptive statistic techniques. Um, measures of position is generally used to uh, measure the variations between scores in a large data pool. So you would have, you would have need, needed to create your scoring criteria already and you would have needed to take uh, multiple snapshots in time and recorded multiple scores for one hypothesis, and then try to identify that statistical anomaly. In many cases, we're gonna utilize measures of frequency uh, to determine the anomaly across data sets. Uh, but in some situations, <clears throat> when the anomaly is low and the variation is high, we're going to need to use more than one and sometimes all of the descriptive statistics to aid us in identifying that difference. Um, we can then take that data analyzed by those descriptive techniques and we can feed them into inferential statistics to determine our probability. Um, I listed a couple here, there's actually quite a few more, um, but the ones that uh, I've you've seen utilized the most and we've seen the most examples of um, start off with Bayes' theorem, which essentially is used to determine the probability from prior collected data or prior collected measurement. Then we have analysis of variance, which is going to take the measures of frequency and the measures of variance and determine the differences between the probability of variations uh, remaining the same. And then finally, we have regression, and regression will aid us in determining the outcome of the score if we were to test the scoring structure in another data set from the same data. All right, so start off with measures of frequency. I'm gonna use measures of frequency with that assumption number one. So uh, assumption number one is a remote service creation is a malicious factor. And this is the most common form of descriptive statistic technique that I see utilized in scoring when uh, compared to like the different clients I work for. And it's very simple, we just simply count the amount of events from our data set and then determine that baseline deviation. So the example I give is the prevalence of locally created services across three environments outweighs remotely created services 1,001. So obviously this isn't a very uh, granular approach with the measures of frequency, it can be, um, but this example it's not going to be, it's gonna be from more, a more high level. And the conclusion is legitimate remote service creation is actually very rare across three environments. So we're gonna score the occurrence of Sysmon event ID 12, registry key creation into that HKLM system, current control set services, with a correlated Sysmon event ID of three, network connection initiated, with a score higher than that of locally created services. So in this case, we have two outcomes and we score one of them higher than the other one. And so you could create a scoring structure that simply states like for, a, a service creation event. If it is a remote service creation event, score it higher than if it was a locally created service. And then here's how we normally take that measure of frequency and feed that into probability, okay? So here we're going to take assumption number two um, and we're going to assume that we already did that measure of frequency uh, data analysis and then feed that into our probability process, right? So we start off with that experiment. The binary created in the registry should be services.exe. And then we're gonna come up with two outcomes because of that. And we identify that the binaries used in the occurrence of service registry key creation was reg.exe and services.exe. Event one is services.exe, which is the 95% of the occurrence. And then event two, the binary was registry.exe, which only accounted for 5% of the occurrence, right? So we, we can then take that inverse of the probability and turn it into our score of malicious, or more accurately, our score of how abnormal it is in the environment. And we would give reg.exe a, a, a malicious score of 9.5 because it is very abnormal for that binary to be creating the services, the service underneath that registry key in our data pool as compared to our other occurrence, which is services.exe. Now, in reality, you might have multiple processes creating that services key. You could see PowerShell doing it. You could see reg.exe doing it. Maybe you see regedit doing it. Maybe you see services.exe doing it. And in that case, we would score all those differently um, based on that inverse of the probability. 
And then we come to assumption number three, and we're going to use a more advanced theory, with this, which is Bayes' theorem. And so assumption number three is auto start services are a malicious factor. With Bayes' theorem, essentially what we're going to do is it relies on the prior validated information to make inferences about future probability. So again, this is, this is moving into that inferential statistic. The prior validated information is the marginal probability that we can predict regardless of whether the service is or is not malicious. So what this is doing is we're looking for a range and we're going to remove the question on whether or not this is malicious. And we're just going to rely on the question of is this an anomaly? So here we have PA, which is the percentage of services that are auto start type as compared to all services created in our data set. We have PB, which is the number of service creations that have been determined to, to be malicious, which we're going to remove from this equation, right? Because it's not that it's not important, but it's, it's skewing our results. So we have PA, which is the number of auto start services as compared to all services created, which would equal 13 out of 52. We're gonna use easy math to make this really simple. So 13 out of 52 services created were auto start type. That equals 25%. So based on this historical data, we can say there's a 25% chance that a service will be auto start without knowing if it is malicious or not. And that's okay. We don't need to necessarily know if it's malicious right away. We can then do that statistical inference and we can deduce the probability of data from Bayes' theorem. Uh, inference is basically just deducing probability distribution from a data. And we're going to try to identify that marginal probability, that range. So once we've identified that range from highest to lowest, um, we've identified our range and we can infer our probability to determine a score. And then finally, let's talk about measures of position. It was that last uh, descriptive statistic that I put on there. And uh, this is kind of a unique scenario. I, I personally don't run into this situation very, very often because I haven't seen a lot of environments that have a, a scoring structure that has been, um, has been up to date and kept up to date long enough, okay? Um, but in this example, we're going to use that assumption uh, number four, which was the process is requesting to create services should normally be sc.exe, right? So for measures of position, what we're gonna do is we're gonna identify the variances between multiple data set over a period of time, or we're gonna identify the variances of one data set, but multiple snapshots in time over a long period of time, okay? So uh, measures of position will identify the uh, information on average, dispersion and shape. It'll also give the, the five numbers are the minimum, the first portal, the median, the third quartile, and then the maximum. All right, so again, that assumption number four is what we're gonna use here. We've determined that the deviation from baseline scores across many data sets from multiple client environments um, that are specific snapshots in time within those data sets are concluded to 14 scores that represent the deviation of anomaly. So even though I've listed only five numbers up here, know these numbers are derived from 14 scores. So using that information, we can plot these five scores here, which are the minimum, the first quartile, the median, the third quartile, and the maximum. We would then calculate the outliers. We're using a box graph. So when we're using a box graph, the outliers fall beyond the location of the fences, which are, these, uh, which are located at 57 and 96. Since none of the numbers fall with outside of that range, there is essentially no outliers in the situation. If there were outliers in the situation, we would need to compute those outliers and identify uh, essentially what are the variances in that data set specifically that create those outliers. We also find the mean of all five numbers, which is 75.64, but more importantly, we identify that standard deviation as 12.39. We can take the standard deviation and try to attempt to identify the marginal probability of the difference remaining constant across the data pool. So we can try to identify that range that's different across the data pool. This deviation can act as, a, act as a flexible weight for our scoring, and it can also, in many cases, act as a standard deviation proof of concept that we can identify when our scoring is basically out of control. And at that point, we can use this as an indicator that our scoring needs drastic tuning. All right, so once we've done our, our data analysis, analysis or our statistic-based analytics, um, we can then identify the differences in that criteria. We must then identify the behavior relationships that begin to form our empirical scoring. So the empirical score is derived from the evidence of the statistical analysis, and the empirical scoring must be documented so that future analysts can research, tune, and account for variance in that score. How do we prevent stagnating our conclusions? Empirical scoring requires constant testing to validate our hypothesis and create those conclusions. 
We have to account for the changes in environments, endpoint software, and processes and practices for our people, and that change over time. So ideally, this is where machine learning could be utilized to validate those metrics and remain and, and, and focus on those conclusions remaining the same, and as well as alert when those conclusions are then different. There is expected to be some margin of error. So there is the admissible decision rule, which is a statistical understanding that there is no better alternative to this. We're essentially doing the best that we can with our statistic analysis, and our conclusions are the best based on our current tool set and our experience as analysts. Speaking of experience of analysts, we often also consider that there is always going to be some, some bias in our conclusion, because defenders will always bring their experience to the table, and all analysts, regardless of how hard we try to rule out that bias, we must account for that bias in some way. Generally, this is done with a margin of error. So we'll need to account for our incomplete knowledge and that margin of error. Um, and as soon as there is a, a outlier beyond that margin of error, we then need to go back and validate our conclusions. All right, so uh, I mentioned Jared Atkinson and the funnel of fidelity. I mentioned Johnny Johnson in his uh, GitHub. He, uh, he has on there his notebook projects, which are uh, extremely useful tools both in research and in actual client environments. And then I linked his research up there as well. And then finally, there is my research for my post. And then I wanted to include some links that I used for my statistical analysis. These were, most of these were derived of these examples that were in here. And that is it. Uh, I appreciate you attending my presentation and I hope you were able to take away some of these considerations into your own environment. I'll be here if there's any questions.